Back in 1924, physicists Niels Bohr, Hendrik Kramers, and John Slater proposed this theory as a final attempt to reconcile classical physics with quantum phenomena. They were working with the old quantum theory which tried to impose quantum rules on classically describable behavior. BKS theory clung to the classical wave description of electromagnetic fields. It was more of a research program than a fully fleshed out physical theory. The goal to disprove Einstein's hypothesis of the light quantum, or what we now call photons. They were trying to prove that light could be explained without resorting to the idea of particles. One of the most intriguing aspects of BKS theory was the concept of virtual oscillators. Instead of using the apparent frequencies of Bohr orbits, Bohr, Kramers and Slater suggested modeling atomic behavior with oscillators at the absorption and emission frequencies. This clever idea spurred Max Born, Werner Heisenberg and Hendrik Kramers to develop matrix mechanics, the first form of modern quantum mechanics. Yes, BKS theory played a crucial role in pushing the boundaries and sparking new ideas. The theory also stirred up significant debate and brought renewed attention to the foundational issues of the old quantum theory. But here's the kicker. BKS theory proposed that energy and momentum wouldn't necessarily be conserved in each interaction, only statistically overall. This idea was, well, a bit too provocative and didn't hold up when tested experimentally. Enter Walter Boerter and his famous both Geiger coincidence experiment. This experiment, conducted with Hans Geiger, showed that conservation laws hold true in every single interaction. This was a critical blow to BKS theory. For his groundbreaking work, Bota was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1954. For Niels Bohr, the disproof of the BKS theory wasn't just about acknowledging the existence of photons. Instead, it highlighted a crucial lesson. The limitations of classical space-time pictures in understanding phenomena within the quantum domain. This realization would become a cornerstone in developing the notion of complementarity just a few years later. Werner Heisenberg, one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, believed that Max Born's statistical interpretation also had its roots in the BKS theory. Despite its failure, BKS theory provided a significant contribution to the revolutionary shift from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. This shift was more than a mere transition. It was a paradigm shift that reshaped our understanding of the physical world. And speaking of persistence, Erwin Schrödinger, another key figure in quantum mechanics, wouldn't abandon the statistical interpretation that emerged from the BKS theory. He continued to push this theory steadfastly until the end of his life. So, uh, what can we learn from this? As we progress further into the labyrinth of quantum mechanics, it's time to delve into the development phase with Bohr and Kramers. Slater's main intention seems to have been to reconcile the two conflicting models of radiation, the wave and particle models. He may have had good hopes that his idea regarding oscillators vibrating at the differences of the frequencies of electron rotations rather than at the rotation frequencies themselves might be attractive to Bohr. This solved a problem in Bohr's atomic model, even though the physical meaning of these oscillators was far from clear. However, Bohr and Kramers had two objections to Slater's proposal. Firstly, the assumption that photons exist. Although Einstein's photon hypothesis could explain the photoelectric effect and the conservation of energy during atomic transitions, Bohr was always reluctant to accept the reality of photons. His main argument was the challenge of reconciling photons with the phenomenon of interference. Secondly, there was the issue of accounting for energy conservation in processes where an atom de-excites and subsequently excites a neighboring atom. This impossibility followed from Slater's probabilistic assumption which did not imply any correlation between processes occurring in different atoms. As Max Jammer puts it, this refocused the theory to harmonize the physical picture of the continuous electromagnetic field with the physical picture, not as Slater had proposed of light quanta, but of the discontinuous quantum transitions in the atom. Bohr and Kramers hoped to evade the photon hypothesis through Kramer's ongoing work on describing dispersion, what we now term as inelastic scattering, of light using a classical theory of radiation and matter interaction. Abandoning the concept of the photon, they chose instead to accept the possibility of non-conservation of energy and momentum. This daring move, while controversial, marked another significant step towards the modern understanding of quantum mechanics.
When Albert Einstein introduced the light quantum photon in 1905, there was much resistance from the scientific community. However, when in 1923, the Compton effect showed the results could be explained by assuming the light beam behaves as light quanta and that energy and momentum are conserved, Niels Bohr was still resistant against quantized light, even repudiating it in his 1922 Nobel Prize lecture. So Bohr found a way of using Einstein's approach without also using the light quantum hypothesis by reinterpreting the principles of energy and momentum conservation as statistical principles. Thus, it was in 1924 that Bohr, Hendrik Kramers and John C. Slater published a provocative description of the interaction of matter and electromagnetic interaction, historically known as the BKS paper that combined quantum transitions and electromagnetic waves, with energy and momentum being conserved only on average. The initial idea of the BKS theory originated with Slater, who proposed to Bohr and Kramers the following elements of a theory of emission and absorption of radiation by atoms to be developed during his stay in Copenhagen. Emission and absorption of electromagnetic radiation by matter is realized in agreement with Einstein's photon concept. A photon emitted by an atom is guided by a classical electromagnetic field, C.F. Louis de Broglie's ideas published September 1923, consisting of spherical waves, thus enabling an explanation of interference. Even when there are no transitions, there exists a classical field to which all atoms contribute. This field contains all frequencies at which an atom can emit or absorb a photon, the probability of such an emission being determined by the amplitude of the corresponding Fourier component of the field. The classical field is not produced by the actual motions of the electrons, but by motions with the frequencies of possible emission and absorption lines, to be called virtual oscillators, creating a field to be referred to as virtual as well. This fourth point reverts to Max Planck's original view of his quantum introduction in 1900. Planck also did not believe that light was quantized. He believed that a black body had virtual oscillators and that only during interactions between light and the virtual oscillators of the body was the quantum to be considered. Max Planck said in 1911, Mr. Einstein, it would be necessary to conceive of light waves themselves as atomistically constituted, and hence to give up Maxwell's equations. This seems to me a step which in my opinion is not yet necessary. I think that first of all, one should attempt to transfer the whole problem of the quantum theory to the area of the interaction between matter and radiation. The BKS theory, although eventually proven incorrect, was a critical stepping stone. It showcased the relentless pursuit of understanding, illustrating the scientific method's self-correcting nature. It was a bold, albeit temporary, reconciliation of classical and quantum views, a testament to the era's innovative spirit.